Um, so this is a fishbowl format. I'll do some introductions in a minute, but uh, um, I will just kind of explain how that's going to go and then I'll do some introductions. But uh, one thing that we're trying to get here is participation from the crowd. Um, and so if you feel like moving up closer to us, you're welcome to do so. I'm not going to force anyone, but it would be nice to have uh, people a bit closer. Um, okay, thank you for joining us. Uh, what we're talking about today is uh, systems who have Im implemented OER programs. What was the, and particularly we have four really interesting systems who've done uh, quite extensive work in OER programs. And, and the question posed to this group is what were the watershed moments or watershed decisions that transformed the process and, or process, depending on where you're coming from, um, of that program? Um, this is a participatory um, uh, format here. And so the way it's going to work is I'm, I have some questions and we're going to do some introductions in a minute. And then as much as possible, I'm hoping this group can talk amongst themselves for a while, posing each other questions. And then we are going to request uh, to open up to questions to all of you. There is a catch, however, if you want to ask a question, you are asked and invited to come up on stage and sit and join the fishbowl and that will knock someone off of the, the group here. Uh, if you feel terribly uncomfortable with that idea, uh, we also have a roving mic that will uh, be able to um, be brought to you to ask your question. But So be prepared, get yourself psyched up while we're doing this to think about how uh, you want to ask your question and get psyched up to come up on stage with us. And we will be delighted to have you join us. Um, OK. I, I want to frame as well, uh, as I mentioned, the topic today is watershed moments, watershed decisions, these big critical things that happen when things go from idea to an explosion that you didn't expect or maybe did expect and hope for. Um, but what are these kinds of decisions and moments that we have that that uh, in system level OER projects that have made this happen. Um, I do want to make also a comment. I know this is OE, OE Global. Uh, just a quick show of hands, who here is not from North America? Okay, a, a, cup, a, a couple. So just very important to note that, that um, the context in North America is very different than is, is in Europe, um, Asia, other parts of the world. And, Largely, the, at least the, the um, instigation of OER projects in North America, largely around cost to students, um, and, and the drivers are different elsewhere. So uh, all our representatives up here are representatives from North American um, institutions, so I think keep that in mind. But I'm hoping that some of the watershed is about the excitement of doing things that isn't just uh, reducing costs for students. Um, Okay, so what's important here is I think that we all want to understand what are these things, these decisions that people made that created some kind of energy that was exciting and unexpected. And hopefully we can talk a little bit about that today. And I think also just to say maybe some watershed of things we did that were terrible decisions or really went wrong and maybe we could avoid those or maybe some of you could avoid those if we've already made those um, uh, mistakes up here. Um, each of the four distinct, esteemed, distinct, esteemed panelists that we have here are representatives of institutions and systems who've implemented some of the most famous OER programs in the whole world. Um, and um, I will just quickly introduce everyone. So we have, uh, my name is Hugh, by the way, I should have done that right at the beginning. I'm the uh, uh, CEO at Pressbooks, and Pressbooks has the good fortune, I guess all uh, four of you use Pressbooks in different kinds of ways, but Pressbooks, for those who don't know, is a platform used by many OER publishing programs, um, and we are very proud to be a key part of this community and also happy to be in person again. So uh, our panelists here, I will go from less left to right, Clint Lalonde, who is one of the first uh, people from the world of education to send me an email and say, do you think that Pressbooks might work for an OER publishing program? And I said, yes, uh, but Clinton Lund is at BC campus. 
<laughs> Amanda's also at BC Campus. Exactly. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and for those who don't know, BC Campus was probably, uh, certainly one of, probably the first really big OER um, system level uh, projects that put, uh, really got this movement moving, at least from my perspective. Uh, Mary Gu uh, is from Ontario's in the house, from eCampus Ontario. Um, eCampus Ontario has been uh, uh, done tons of often st awesome stuff. If you look at the Pressbooks directory, you're going to see lots of it is filled with all the great content coming of in Ontario. Um, I think Ontario really had the advantage as well of building on a lot of the learnings from BC campus and, and thinking about um, how to implement things there. We also have um, Bo Young Che, who's from the, I always get this uh, acronym wrong, so I'm going to say the words as they're written down here, the Washington State Board of Technical and Community Colleges. Um, and <laughs> how many colleges are represented? 34, yeah. Um, a little bit newer uh, in, in, in the system level implementation than eCampus Ontario and BC Campus, and, uh, but no less amazing. Um, and finally, uh, Stephanie Green, who is from the <laughs> Maricopa Community Colleges. And Stephanie, unlike uh, the rest of the panelists, is a faculty member. And so she's coming from a different perspective, um, maybe, than the system uh, administrators. OK. Um, that is the introduction. So thank you, everyone. Um, and I'm going to start with um, just the, uh, the first question. Um, and I will just ask each of our panelists, and to try to do it relatively briefly, but just to introduce yourself, your uh, system program, and, and what the focus has been, and maybe give us a hint of, of some things you might talk about, but just uh, give us an overview of who you are, what you do, and what your system's doing, and, and uh, maybe the scale of things and, and how it's been going. So handing over to, to Clint. Yes, sure. yeah. Hi, does this work? Yep, good. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know it's the first session right after lunch, and it's also the last day. And so I think uh, you know, hopefully <laughs> the energy is not starting to wane a little bit. So I really appreciate you uh, coming to this session. Uh, my name is Clint Lalonde. I'm the director of open education for BC campus. I use the pronouns he, him. And I'm very happy to be back here on Treaty 6 territory and uh, Metis Region 4 territory. Um, anybody who has followed my social media for the last couple of days knows that I spent a lot of time here when I was uh, between the ages of 19 and 24 living in Edmonton. Uh, and this is the first time I've been back here for 30 years. So it's been very nice to kind of come back and revisit uh, one of the places that I like to consider my home. Uh, I don't live in Edmonton anymore. I now live in uh, Lekwungen territory, which is the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations on Vancouver Island, uh, 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 colonially known as Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, which is where uh, one of the offices of BC Campus is and where we're located. Uh, BC Campus is a sector-wide support for the British Columbia higher education system. And for those of you who are not from Canada, British Columbia, province just west of here, uh, uh, in Canada, we have uh, higher education as the responsibility of the provinces. So we have uh, provincial organizations like eCampus, Campus Manitoba, BC Campus to help support initiatives uh, through the post-secondary systems uh, uh, in, their, in our uh, relative provinces. So we have 25 public post-secondary institutions in British Columbia. We support those institutions uh, mostly around teaching and learning practices uh, and open education has been a key uh, focus for us for the past uh, over 20 years. We actually had some really visionary leaders around the time that MIT OpenCourseWare began that saw this model and uh, wanted to bring it to British Columbia. Columbia. Uh, and so uh, around, uh, I think, 2003, 2004, uh, uh, BC Campus began a program called the Online Program Development Fund. And the intent of that fund was inspired by MIT OpenCourseWare, but it was also to try to prepare the system uh, for this uh, fairly new thing that was online learning. And how do we develop courses for online learning? And, and how can we uh, share those courses amongst the institutions? And so the Online Program Development Fund uh, began with, uh, with some of those goals in mind uh, to build some system efficiency. Uh, 
Uh, in 2012, we had one of our very first watershed, uh, well, not very first, but one of our uh, major watershed uh, moments, uh, which I will talk about when uh, a minister uh, of advanced education at the time uh, was uh, uh, in a presentation about the 2012 uh, UNESCO OER uh, recommendation and was very inspired by that and came back to the province and said, is there anybody in British Columbia who's doing open education? And there happened to be an organization in British Columbia working in open education which was BC Campus, uh, and that led to the launch of our open textbook program, which began in 2012. Uh, so we have been doing this for a long time uh, uh, in open education. Uh, our open textbook uh, project has been huge, massive. Uh, we've, uh, in, in terms of student savings, I won't always talk about the student savings, but it is significant. Uh, we've saved students around $40 million in textbook costs through an open textbook project. Uh, we fund various uh, creation, collaboration projects around open education, the development of resources, the adaptation of resources. We do work in uh, developing open policy for higher education as well. Uh, so uh, my uh, colleague Amanda Coolidge here was very uh, instrumental in, in working on uh, open tenure, sh uh, tenure uh, um, uh, framework. Uh, and uh, and we, we, we basically are an incubator for open uh, initiatives within the province of British Columbia. Uh, I think I will leave it at that and pass it over to Mary. Clint, have you ever considered being less succinct and uh, articulate? It's really, it's really <laughs> challenging to be right after you. It's, uh, so let me just like gather myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my name is Mary Gu, and I'm a librarian with eCampus Ontario's Open Library. I've been with the library for about a year and a half, so I definitely am new to the area, learning as I go, doing my best. So forgive me for any inaccuracies. It's absolutely my fault. <laughs> uh, but uh, to talk a little bit about eCampus Ontario. Uh, you have Ontario is uh, located in Ontario, which is the province sort of on the, on the east side. It looks kind of like a pork chop, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> it's a provincially funded nonprofit. And we work with 53 uh, colleges, universities, and indigenous institutions to deliver services, supports, programs to them. And our goal and mission is really to lead and co-design, really important word here, co-design with our member institutions in order to uh, help Ontario's post-secondary st sector lead the way in terms of creating student-focused, student-centered, and innovative le digital learning experiences. I don't think that's exactly the mission, but it's most of the right words, so forgive me. <laughs> um, but in terms of some of the major milestones if with eCampus, actually, I don't think I can talk to that level. I'm going to talk about the open library, so forgive me here. We do so much that I've, I find it hard to keep track of all the things that we do. So I'll talk a little about the open library. So we, were, we first launched in 2017, uh, in part because of the amazing work of BC Campus who were open to collaborating with us. So actually our, the first set of our collections was a mirrored copy of BC Campus's amazing work because we wanted to bring that over to the Ontario context. And since then we've grown quite a lot. Uh, we've done things like major milestones including metadata project with York universities, uh, of course, launching press books at this very shortly after launching as a library because to have open library requires us to provide support in terms of digital, the open publishing aspect. Um, other major projects since then have included things like the creation and launch of H5P Studio, which was, I think, one of the first of its kind when it was launched in 2020, <laughs> early 2020. So good timing on the team's part at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, around the same time as 2020, well, announced in 2019 and then started executing in 2020 is the virtual learning strategy, which is a major investment by the government of Ontario into the post-secondary sector. And I was, I believe Lindsay already mentioned in the keynote on the first day, it's $70 million of investment over three years, which is ultimately one of our biggest, and you know, of course our more recent watershed moments. Having that funding was incredible for the sector and it's been incredible to see what the sector has done with that money. And I think the rest of the sort of the comments I'll be making throughout the panel will be reflecting upon that because that's mostly what I've experienced in the time that I've been here. Um, and also because you, it can't begin to really articulate all the things that it's been made possible since then. So I'm done for now. Yeah. Hi, oh, I don't think it's, oh, it's, it's yes. on. <laughs> 
Hi, my name is Bo Young. I'm a policy associate of Open Education working with Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. I work as a state representatives for our community and technical colleges uh, open education initiatives. Uh, I always thought we'd been doing this for a long time, but I realized why we, he recognized us as one of the newer members. <laughs> it's been 10 years, only 10 years. <laughs> and then um, we first started about 10 years ago with this statewide project called Open Course Library, which had a great aim to produce uh, 81 open course packages. And uh, through that project, we there were a lot of lessons learned about what to do, and especially a lot of what not to do. And one of the biggest lessons that we got out of our very initial project like 10 years ago was that there has to be a matching professional development without the suite of uh, faculty support that helps colleges to implement whatever that we've developed. It's practically it's going to mean nothing. So we worked really hard to build a suite of uh, professional development uh, that provides all levels of support, including our OER one-on-one training that we have been providing for mm -hmm. our system colleges since 2014. And I think accumulated total number of faculty members who went through that training is over, I think, four or 5,000, and we actually stopped counting after that point. And then we've been actually opening our training to the grantees of TACT program. I, I don't know if any, anybody remember. So our training was a flagship training for all TACT grantees from 800 community colleges of this country. And then we invited them every month, and we used to have 112 people in our training every month. Mm -hmm. So that was some time. <laughs> And so after building those uh, suite of professional development tools uh, and repositories and all of those, we realized that at some point that, you know, despite all of this incredible amount of resources that we provide and thousands of faculty members go going through our training, still OER seems to be remain as this uh, random and elusive opportunity for our students. You have to be super lucky to accidentally sign up for the OER courses. So we thought so we saw that as an equity issue, which I'll talk about it later through our conversation. And we uh, ended up uh, having this uh, OER and low-cost labeling policies fully implemented, integrated into our administrative system that currently benefits our students um, the, every you know every quarter. And I, again, I will share more details through our conversation today. And that's one of our um, major focus from our system. And uh, from there, we realize we the direction that we are heading is that whenever we make a move in our open ed, we'll make sure that it's functioning within our infrastructure that has three major elements, including research, policy, and professional development. So whenever we make a, decide, make a decision on any of those items, it should be within the uh, it should be cohesive with other elements. So if we are doing the professional development, then it should, there, it should be data driven. There has to be a, a back policy that backs up. And if there is any sort of uh, obstacle we find, and if it can be handled by policy change, then we'll go for it. So nothing will be done because I felt like it one day. <laughs> So it actually really helped gaining some credibility within the system. So I think there's now less feeling in our agency, in our system, that state board will do something behind, you know, college's bag and drop, you know, drop it on their shoulder one day. So there is that sense of uh, collaborative community investment in open ed, and I think I can confidently say that it's actually a norm in our system. It's nobody is surprised or shocked or like you know to, to go against the protest or something. So, mm -mm, oh yeah, we get it. It's a good thing. Okay. And I'm Stephanie Green, and I am faculty, as Hugh mentioned, at Maricopa uh, Community. Maricopa County Community Colleges. We're one of 10, uh, we have 10 colleges across the Metroplex. And um, I'm fairly new to OER. Um, I, I didn't come as, I didn't come into this from education, but um, I was only introduced about four years ago. So, um, um, and then immediately uh, Pressbook Pilot came out at our college. And then uh, we were, uh, granted funding, and we were able to get uh, press books going during the pandemic, which was really very fortunate for us because then we'd have something to communicate and share with our faculty. And uh, um, that was a really big deal. And so the good news is that um, I was one of the first ones to adopt a press book uh, for my class or create one, and uh, I get to use it. And um, it was really um, just a handful of that started it, you know, and now we're over 400 
books. So now we're like, what are we going to do next? So that's kind of like our one of our watershed moments that I'll speak about a little later. All right. So I think my job is to just inspire um, some questions. I do want to say for everyone out there, what's important here, and that we've chosen these four uh, panelists on purpose, and they sound like superheroes because they all are superheroes. But you know, the story is about. Um, often finding a way to get the support to make the uh, these initiatives work, and so I, I'm I'm curious. So it is certain that seventy million dollars sure helps making um, an OER project easier to implement. Maybe not easier, but uh, scaling up. But you know, one of the things that I'm interested in, as as I sort of step aside here, is just what are the things that that you feel helped get to the point where someone said yes to 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 those request because everyone starts with nothing and somehow we have to get to that point where we've proved a certain amount. So anyway, I will step aside perhaps and let let someone else ask a question of, among this, this group. But the first question is just what about that watershed? What was the watershed moment? And maybe maybe I'll start on, on the far end there with Stephanie and then and then you can sort of pass that pass that along. Well um like like uh, the others had shared, you know, we, we also offer, you know, initially it was like, you know, um, our OER, uh, I know programming really began about a decade ago at Maricopa where we came out with Maricopa Millions and the goal was to, obviously to save money um, from expensive textbooks, which we did uh, in a record amount of time. And so uh, like, um, like the others have shared, we, we've saved a lot of money. But also, the other thing is um, program develop, uh, you know, professional development for our faculty. So then offering those uh, sessions to kind of draw them in, like, oh, look what I did, and then uh, promoting it during uh, like open ed week and things like that. So, um, you know, we offer them a, a little bit of monetary support uh, to kind of draw them in, and then uh, hopefully, and we obviously. Once you do it, then you're going to stick with it and you're going to keep doing it and expanding on it, right? And then you kind of build that community of practice within those faculty members about, hey, what did you do? What did you do? And then the other the other important thing that I failed to mention while ago is that at each of our colleges, we also have like a go-to person, an admin person who can help the faculty member that you know who it is on your campus that you can talk to, which is really beneficial. Oh, <laughs> going to <through> this. <laughs> um, for us, the, the, our turning point was definitely the thing that I mentioned earlier, our systems OER and locus labeling policies. So our state has established and implemented these two policies that require our colleges to label the courses that use OER and locus labels, uh, and, and the OER and the locus materials that are $50 or less. So that, um, policy, um, what it does is that that labels actually show up in our students' class search page as course attributes. Mm -hmm. So students can filter and they can make informed choices at the time of registration. So those policies have been fully legislated and so now it's part of the state law and integrated into our system colleges, our 34 system colleges administrative system that allows us to have this bird eye view about total number of class actions labeled and the total number of and students enrolled in those classes. And we are actually in the process of connecting those data into um, our student achievement data, which will give us more holistic view about like true impact of those labels on student achievement and their career path. The thing about this policy is that because it actually show up as a course attributes in the student's class search page, it became a visible, it, OER became a vi, became this visible option for our students. It uh, brought the students back to the center of the conversation. Because usually before, uh, students were always at the uh, receiving end of OER. Like, you know, the, everything is made and for faculty members and college administrators and students are just supposed to enjoy the benefit of it. But um, because it's so obvious, obviously there, students talk about it, they inquire about it. If they don't see it, they question why, don't, why doesn't it exist in our class search page for our campus. So, it, um, now, it, now the students are the major and viral force of our systems OER move. Mm. And um, it actually does open our eyes and made us really conscious about open pedagogy. And uh, 
this change of our mindset and practice that came from this, uh, the OER and local sibling policies have truly been a turning point um, in the way we practice in our agency. And later, uh, maybe I can delve into more about how we got to that point of establishing that, uh, the labels. I'm so interested to hear more from you, Boyan and Stephanie, about the student work. So at eCampus Ontario, I suppose because the fact that we're a consortium and our members are the institutions themselves, we are a, like a little bit removed from the students often in our work, though our team is quite interested in talking more and more about how we can get at the students and understand more of their needs as a part of the convening work that we want to be doing. Um, but with that framing, that does mean that a lot of the work we do and the impacts and the programs that have had impacts has been at the educator faculty level. And the one that comes to mind, I mean, there's been so many moments in the history of the Open Library campus that I could call out. But the thing that comes to mind that certainly really inspires our current team right now is probably the OE Fellows programs that was in 2017. Hopefully that's right. Um, Jenny might know. <laughs> Jenny was one of the OE Fellows. Um, and that work continues to inspire us because ultimately the open education is for people um, and through the OE fellows program we engaged a handful of educators in the sector to engage with open education to do a project to really get the experience of it through a facilitated um, experience with the campus and I and those folks I think pretty much all of them continued in some way to engage with open education since many of them are now major champions of open education beyond Ontario's context. And that continues to inspire us, which is what's led to one of our recent programs, which is the OER Rangers, which is an ex basically an expansion of that project, recognizing where we are now and the, the impact that those individuals have had once they had the opportunity, the time, the space, the funding, and the structure to engage with open education. And I will just remind everybody we're about to open up the fishbowl, so <laughs> get your questions ready and be uh, ready to join us up here. Um, in British Columbia, I'd say we have, we, there have been a number of watershed moments, and some of those, I would say, there have been some that are externally driven by what has been happening in wider society or the wider open education community that have become watershed moments, and there's more internal ones, and by internal, I mean within our system in British Columbia. So, for example, a, an external one was 2012 with the uh, UNESCO OER Declaration, the Paris Declaration. Um, that one was significant because uh, for whatever reason, the Minister of Advanced Education happened to hear somebody speaking very articulately about that and the importance of it and was inspired to, uh, to come back and find somebody to do that kind of work within the system. Um, and so, uh, you know, when, when we hear people like Cable talk about uh, and, and the Sustainable Development Goals and UNESCO and these sort of guiding documents that are out there, I'd say those are key watershed moments that we can build our work on and to try to always uh, push our work back to refer to that, especially if you have governments that have signed on to these agreements and have said that they are going to be meeting some of the requirements of, of these agreements. So, so that in 2012 uh, really kind of released our first batch of funding to do open education work, which was uh, 500, I think it was a half a million dollars to do the first open textbook um, project. Uh, which we had success with right away, so we were able to build on successes. We had uh, adoptions. Uh, um, I, another uh, sort of watershed moment was uh, a decision to uh, reach out to other open projects that were happening at that time. This is 2012, so there were a few open textbook projects that were, uh, you know, just sort of in the in the in the formative stages. Uh, open Stacks at of Rice University. Uh, we actually convened uh, our very first open textbook summit, which was a very small gathering of about a dozen uh, people who were uh, working in open education at that time. And our, our agenda was like, how can we work together? How can we collaborate on this? Like this is, this is, these were the seeds of collaboration uh, that uh, really served us well for the, uh, the early years of the project to be able to have people who were going through the same kind of growing pains that we were going through, uh, that were looking for solutions and we were looking for solutions. We had a little community that we were able to pull on. So uh, uh, in terms of a lesson learned, you know, being 
at a conference like this and building connections and building those networks is very important to the long-term sustainability uh, of the projects. And the last uh, watershed moment that I want to talk about, I think it was about 2015, and the watershed moment was the decision, um, and it was probably Mary and Amanda who made this decision to involve students and to go out to student governments and to start working with them to uh, help them, uh, enable them to become advocates for this, to raise the profile that this was an issue, uh, and the students knew it was an issue, but they didn't feel like they had a voice about the issue. So, you know, we, we provided some tools to help give them a voice within their own institutions to be able to advocate for this and say, this is a real issue with our, uh, we can't afford to, to pay for education, and this is uh, something that can help. Um, now, there were some pieces of that that maybe backfired once in a while as students pushed maybe a little too hard in the beginning with some faculty and that, you know, maybe caused some people to kind of pull back a little bit. Uh, but eventually found, uh, the student advocates found their footing and found a, gr a great voice in how to do this and actually were instrumental in, uh, it was students who met with the minister in 2018, 2019, and, uh, and got BC campus another $3 million to continue to do the work in the open education, and that was students. So that's a watershed moment as well, the decision to actually involve students and have them be advocates for this work. Yeah. Excellent, so <clears throat> we're gonna open up um, the, a seat at the side here, is there? Any volunteer? Oh, there's Jenny. Excellent. Ah, okay, up, Jenny. so am I correct that Clint is now? No, he can stay. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but then, yeah. Sorry, I just so pros, and then and then there'll be another person that comes, and then the person after that, Clint goes off. Is that right? No. We get that. Okay. <laughs> All right. And anybody who wants to come up and fill the other uh, chair that yes. is empty is welcome to Please come do. up. Please do. And and if I could just request, uh, say your name uh, and what institution uh, you are from or where you're from, perhaps. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Jenny Heyman. I am currently at Conestoga College. I'm a chair for online programs. Uh, and I just want to point out, and I feel this is really important, there's such a strong correlation between open and folks in online and instructional design. <laughs> I've noticed that in my career. What I wanted to talk about was, uh, and ask you about, is, is personal and organizational preparedness and knowledge. And how, how because I know I've experienced that. In 2013, I started a Canadian open education, wide world ed um, research nonprofit in Canada way before its time. <laughs> it totally failed. <laughs> but what I learned from that personally and in the network connections that I made enabled all the rest of the good things that happened. And so I'm wondering, um, because most good watershed moments are not so much luck as they are, Prepare, personal and organizational preparedness. So what about your personal or organizational preparedness helped you open that door for the mm -hmm. moment? It is actually, it's actually such a good point that she made uh, because when the idea of OER and locals labeling policies just first came about, um, our, uh, my, my, th th there were a lot of concerns expressed from, especially from my agencies and the college and college leadership. And my answer was, our system has been matured enough. We have a mature soil to start this. Um, you mentioned that the level of preparedness needed for this level of inform. I said, ground one, we have over by count, 4,000 faculty members who went through uh, our initial trainings. Mm -hmm. We have over um, these many programs that I know for sure using the open educational resources. We have 80% of faculty uh, colleges who are currently participating in any level of OER agenda. We have, um, it has been an official 
the, the work uh, agenda for our student association for the past two years. And so for based on those ground, based on those evidences that I, that we declare that we have a mature enough soil to start something this provocative. Requiring our colleges to all together at the same time labeling the courses that use open educational resources under a page long policy guideline was not a joke. So to to reach that point, we I say we needed like eight years of uh, preparation to get to that point. And if we actually have if we started that without going through any of those initial training, initial professional development, and all of those initial argument and conflicted situation resolution point, I think we would have really failed miserably. So thank you for pointing that out. It was not a magic. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, thanks. Okay, hi. I'm Dan Alasso. I teach history in the Minnesota State System, which is a medium-sized system. I guess we're second to SUNY. Uh, we have seven universities and um, 30-ish community colleges. And it does seem that the community, that to, to kind of build on your point, it does seem that the community colleges are kind of a, a, an easier place to start because of less kind of institutional paranoia um, on the part of, on the part of faculty. Um, but my, my question, I guess, and, and my watershed is kind of a negative one, I suppose, because in, especially at the university level in my system, it's been very faculty led and faculty come and go. And, and so that is uh, something that I'm wondering if you've, um, I mean, it seems like the, the panelists have all, you know, are kind of coming from a, a system perspective where the system has really kind of driven the change. Um, I am like, I am trying to see this, this, negative watershed kind of as a as an opportunity rather than just as a challenge um, but I'm still kind of working on figuring out how to make that next step and how to um, you know how to kind of get the system um, moving forward when we are um, cutting a lot of the faculty including myself who are uh, who have been have been uh, really kind of instrumental as volunteers and as people sort of driving the thing forward at the um, at the universities as a faculty member I'll take that one um, you know at our schools you know there's ten of us so our uh, like our initial funding it came from the district office right so it was granted to us to get us going and then um, the other thing is at each of our colleges not all of the colleges have an OER committee I'm actually co-chair of our OER committee and I don't know um, at our institutions once the faculty get in I, they don't necessarily go anywhere. They're pretty much like, that's it, we're done. Um, so we have that long-term, um, people have been there forever. So that, that's helpful for us. But um, our admin at our individual colleges can also give us money, like our uh, VPAA gives us funding to help grow OER on our campus. Uh, and then we also work with the Center for Teaching and Learning. Each college has a Center for Teaching and Learning, and so um, they have OER support too. So we're, we're kind of more collaborative, I guess, on our campuses, having admin and CTA, and then you know the library, the OER librarians, together so we're all just kind of you know volunteering basically on the committee right to help perpetuate it am I allowed to jump into the fishbowl yeah I just one observation that I, I've had and again I'm outside of the system and we but one of the things that I've heard before and we've certainly seen evidence of this is that often a, a buying decision comes from one dogged in, instructor or uh, university professor whatever it is and I think that that so I don't I think probably these people are much better about thinking about how to get faculty engaged but when that pressure comes from the faculty that often can lead to to um, lots of exciting things happen so how you organize it I don't know but but I think it's important that a lot of times administrations are responding to pressure to do projects from from faculty so 
can kind of jump in on this a little bit with your question, Dan. Um, I don't know if this will be quite fit for your context, but one of this, this sort of the aspect of sessional instructors or faculty has been on our mind in terms of our program design. A lot of our more recent programs has been, the baseline requirement is that you are involved with one of our member institutions. We don't care if you're part-time, we don't care which one you're affiliated with, choose one to let us know. As a way of like equity, engaging on the fact that many marginalized folks are uh, sessional. Um, many people who are early or first gen academics are sessional. Um, and so that was something that was on our mind in terms of how do we distribute the funding that we currently have to support the work. And also we ultimately see it as human capacity building one way or another. The more folks who have that opportunity to have to engage with open education and OERs um, is positive. They may end up leaving the system or going to another system, but that's another person who's now had experience, hopefully a positive one. And as we see like, OER is very global. People collaborate across boundaries, borders, et cetera. So I don't know if you're at your institution that is maybe one of the requirements that can be a challenge or barrier for other for sessional and part-time faculty to continue to engage uh, or to get started engaging. Because I have heard that in some cases, like this is not recognized as scholarly work or this is not, or granting uh, opportunities are not available if you're not full-time and that can be a barrier. So that's something that we think about and we know this is a reality and we would definitely advocate for that to be removed. If you are employed in an institution, that you should have full access to as much as the opportunities to get involved with different kind of work as possible there. Amanda, I have, and then I steal I was just gonna ask, I was just gonna ask. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I was just gonna, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I was just gonna add that I was looking at the Minnesota State sort of core commitments and core values and strategic framework. And one thing that I would recommend is that if you were to reach out to like even a dean or just one administrator that you know has some sort of interest within open at all, I would align it directly with the core commitments and core values of Minnesota State. Um, in particular, it are, you've got a ton of language in there about ensuring access to extraordinary education for all Minnesotans. So if you're able to make that alignment and then show where open fits in with the strategic framework, a lot of times that can lead to policy decision changes within the frame in, within Minnesota State so that you're not doing the work off the side of your desk anymore, that a policy could be enacted to be a part of your desk or perhaps some sort of innovation fund that they distributed in Minnesota could have a requirement that that innovation that's done needs to have a CC license on it. But I would just encourage you to try to find that one administrator who can sort of start to help move that up. I came up to the fishbowl to kind of ask maybe a similar question, kind of inspired by Dan. Sorry, Marilyn. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the movement from, from grassroots. Like a lot of people begin doing this grassroots. I'm a volunteer. I'm getting involved. And then you're talking about the minister has done this or we wrote state legislation. From the outside, a lot of times that just looks like magic. Like magic yeah. just happened, right? Like, do you have a, do you have lobbying efforts? How did you make state legislation happen? Do you have outreach? How did you go from a grassroots program to implementing provincial-wide policies or programs? That be, it wasn't clear. It clearly wasn't magic. It's hard work and there's effort to maintain. But it 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 feels kind of daunting for people who haven't done it before, maybe haven't seen it before. Do you have anything to share about those experiences and things you've learned or things your organization does to maintain those relations and make things that were grassroots institutionalized? That's a transition, right? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I can, I can talk a little bit about this. I mean, um, I, I didn't mention in the introduction that we are funded by the Ministry of uh, Post-Secondary Education and Skills and Trades Training, or sorry, um, uh, Future Skills. Uh, the ministry has recently changed names, so. Um, uh, so we uh, actually have a direct pipeline to the ministry for special projects. I mean, this, this came out as a special project. So we do meet with the ministry on a regular occasion because we were born out of a ministry initiative uh, of 23 years ago. And, and we've always have been able to maintain those relationships with the ministry. So that has been very useful for us. And we've been able to continue to advocate directly with uh, people within our, our ministry office and, and gain funding and to be able to launch some initiatives. Now, one thing that we try to do is make sure that any initiatives that we do put on the table align with the ministry goals mm -hmm. and uh, and making sure, you know, just like you, you want to find those documents with
within your institutions that talk about openness and access and stuff. You know, we try to do the same thing with ministry documents. So anytime something comes out from the ministry, we read through the digital learning strategy and where is open mentioned in this and trying to find ways that we can pitch our projects to the ministry that way to be able to support the, the institutions uh, locally. I can actually add the, uh, the, is the example from the Washington State uh, to um, Still's question. <laughs> um, so about like how the grassroots move eventually became a state legislation and state policy. So in our system in 2017, as I mentioned earlier, there, there was this, we, we ran this actually 2015, a statewide research um, that assessed the faculty members' needs and, and the use of open educational resources. And that was pretty comprehensive, quantitative and qualitative research. And one of the discovery that we had from that research was that, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the, there is no equity in terms of uh, students uh, you know, benefiting from the open educational resources. It's really, they have to be super lucky to accidentally sign up for the courses. So some students actually enjoyed OER through four quarter after quarter, and some students actually never, would they, they would never hear about it. They, you know, it's like a, something they never heard about before. So that was the, definitely an equity issue. So we, what we did was we actually just drafted this statewide policy at the state board building um, that require our colleges to label the courses that use uh, OER and low cost labeling policies. And of course, we couldn't just enforce the policy that we just wrote up. Hmm. We ran uh, two rounds of statewide surveys inviting all faculty members and college administrators to uh, provide their input on the policy guideline uh, at a really granular level, including the names of the label, definition, criteria, what's qualified, what's not qualified, all the sample cases, we put it on there and then gave them a chance to wordsmith. So that um, so after going through that two rounds of the research activities, and each time we actually send out the outcome of the research report back to the system, making sure that we are capturing your voices. And, then, and how long how long did that take, Boyan, to oh, do this? Of about about a, about half a year, six months. Wow. And okay. then um, through that uh, act collaboration, we were able to establish uh, a the. Like eight page policy guidelines for OER label. And we invited three colleges to run a pilot. Um, so that was a key. I'm, I'm so glad that we did that. So after, after uh, three colleges running the pilot for about three, uh, for about uh, two quarters, we got very consistent feedback from all three. They said that Boyang, we need another label in addition to OER label that would mark the courses that use other affordable course materials that do not necessarily fit into the definition of OER, such as really inexpensive commercial textbooks, they do exist. So um, we got to work, and but we soon faced another challenge, this time to set the threshold for the law cost. I mean, how low is low, is low enough for you? Is it 40, 50, 60? And couldn't get the consensus on, system-wide consensus, consensus on that number. So we turned to the students and our Washington mm. Community and Technical Colleges Student Association, our mighty student association, they are known as WAXA. They uh, rose up uh, to take up the action and they, they collaborated with our agency and took up uh, the charge and they distributed the, they were in charge of distribution and promotion of the survey and managed to gather first about 5,000 responses. They were on the campus all over the places holding an iPad and a piece of candy, urging their, <laughs> yeah, urging their fellow students to fill out the survey and through that, you know, effort in the month of October and November, they managed to gather about 5,000 responses. And from that, and then that was so moving, actually really moving. And a lot of our system uh, college offices were so moved and many of them voluntarily connect with their own college's student governance office and rally to promote the same survey. And, in, you know, like a library or uh, the e-learning office, bookstore, student services office, they call and say, what can we do to help and manage to increase that number to 10,050. So, so from that 10, survey with student responses of 10,050, we were able to set the threshold. And with that threshold, we ran another round of statewide surveys, uh, inviting faculty members and college administrators again to do their worst missing on the policy guideline, this time for the low cost label. So 
after it, so they were able to edit everything on the policy guideline except the threshold because it's you know, set by the students. So we managed to legislate that uh, at the end and the legislation process was that the, our students the rallied. They, I wish I could just show you the picture of our students gathered in the Congress building. They um, voluntarily uh, called upon their senators and representatives from their district and and asked for the legislative luncheon and breakfast. And legislators love that you know, during that time of the year. <laughs> and so they would, uh, and then they would come to the hearing and testify and every part of the lobbying effort they can give, they did. So at the end, we had this policy guidelines, uh, with policy guidelines legislated, uh, coded, and fully supported by the students, and that was our journey, like from the initiation of the idea one day, oh yeah, I think I can write a policy guideline, and then from that moment to actual legislation, it actually took five years. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing that I wanted, a message that I wanted to share with you, not like, oh, look at the amazing thing we did, but the message is more about be patient, it's a step-by-step -step process. Keep it data-driven because it gives your policy a legitimacy and authority that it needs. And then, and then also the, the data-driven process is such an effective uh, communication and promotional mm -hmm. tool. So later, um, a whole system would feel like that you know it has been the system-wide investment. We have an accountability. It's we are responsible for the success of it. So. So that's a one thing that I wanted to leave with this group. Thank you. I have a curiosity here. Go ahead. Puyang, um, since oh. you mentioned that the um, students led the charge in terms of getting setting that threshold, is there, do you plan ever to update and redo a survey oh, yeah. as economic yeah. Conditions change. Yeah, we, we have been actually. Thank you for bringing that up. We have been having active conversation about that. Like, with current <laughs> changes in in our economy, it's, it's inevitable. Actually, that was under consideration from the beginning. Like five years ago, when we were initiating it, we had a plan to revisit the number uh, and then to see if there is a need for increase that amount and we'll probably get to the work and probably we'll start another round of oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stay by survey thank you for bringing that up Marilyn so hi uh, Marilyn Billings I'm inserting myself into the fishbowl uh, <laughs> formerly from UMass Amherst and now working on the Rotel project with the state of Massachusetts so my understanding of your question Dan was uh, I'm going to back up a little bit further that you're feeling like it's faculty led at your institution and how to move forward from there oh because I could I could back up a little bit on that I have, um, I mean, I have talked to the associate vice chancellor. Mm -hmm. um, I've been on all kinds of, you know, system office committees and councils and things. Um, the, the issue that we're having is that, um, for example, I was, I got a grant to um, explore a Z degree at the university level to sort of extend the, the work of the 10 community colleges that mm -hmm. have already implemented uh, associate's degrees. And so I, and I was planning on, on going, you know, on going in for the implementation grant next year because I had lined up four departments that I, you know, including history with my courses that I thought, you know, were ready to have a, a, a zero textbook cost path through them. And, and then, you know, my campus, uh, and not to make it about me, but, but, but then my, my campus, you know, had this huge budget issue and we're, you know, we're cutting 27 tenured and tenure track faculty. Uh, and so, you know, and, and yeah, see, exactly, right, yeah, that's, that, yeah. And so, and so the so the issue is not so much that we don't, you know, that I don't know where the system-wide institutional support is, is that, you know, the the things that were, um, the things that depended on faculty to make them happen, it, the bottom can, you know, drop out kind of at a moment's notice, and, um, you know, and I don't think that we can correct that in my situation right now, but uh, how do we sort of, future proof these efforts against mm -hmm. that type of thing because I think that what's happening at my university is you know sort of symptomatic of the crisis in higher ed and is probably gonna you know hopefully not at yours but is happening all over the place 
Yes, it is happening all over the place. So a couple of things that I, that I just wanted to mention was uh, one of the things when uh, I was at University of Massachusetts Amherst was I was fortunate that the librarians are considered part of the faculty group, faculty senate governance. And so we worked really closely, the faculty and the librarians, to pull together legislation that was um, approved by the full faculty to um, support open education and, you know, listed a lot of the details that I won't go into right now that, um, the administration is then required to implement. And so then that um, leads to some additional supporting structure happening within the Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, some other groups on the, uh, the faculty support side, and including the librarians that kind of keep these things moving forward. Um, and then, so because it was one campus, then we went to the system level, and then I was able to um, finesse a north Northeast OER summit meeting to bring in the head of our Department of Higher Education and her colleague Bob Awkward, whom some of you may know, and Nicole Allen was just a riot and um, put uh, sparkles on all of the people who were the program committee and I just thought, oh, we'll be we'll sparkle the head of the Massachusetts State legislature, uh, not the legislature, the Department of Education, and got them really integ integral in all of this so that they then went forward to uh, the whole statewide Department of Education so that we were able to put a trial group together at the state level to support these kind of initiatives, and it's, grow it's still growing. Right, so um, just from starting with the faculty, um, I think it was a Gen Ed Council that I worked with, general education, sorry. <laughs> um, and I don't know if that's helpful in supporting some of that uh, infrastructure that's needed there, so. Oh. If I can, I just want, I kinda wanna interject just one quick thing, and, and Kathy, I won't take your time. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested, first of all, Hugh, I'm so deeply grateful for the work you do at Pressbooks that allows us to publish ourselves. <laughs> deeply grateful. So I'm thinking there's, a, there's kind of a book in this because a lot of these shared stories are, are organizational, but we don't know all the pathways, so it's you know, like holes in the fences. How do you, <laughs> how do you get into organizations and governments and, and spread these ideas? Um, there's a lot of really great strategies that I hear, and it would be a really great idea possibly to capture those, those strategies for you know, being able to take advantage of the watershed moment. Yeah. I don't yeah. know anybody. <laughs> anyway, I've got some ideas. <laughs> okay, so Minnesota State University System. So I just presented with Heather Blicker, the ACRL Affordability and OER Roadshow to your librarians. So my question, and they are on it, and they know what's going on. So I guess my question would be. Have you found yourself to your librarians? And you all spoke to that, how important they were in the process. And uh, so that, I'm ending with a question mark. Have you found your way to your librarian? Yes, on the 19th, because I'm 17. Perfect, okay, so that's, they'll come alongside you. Yeah. And I think the whole, Well, and in terms of developing like the resilient kind of systems that, you know, can resist that kind of, of change where like, you know, one leg gets cut off and it falls down. I think, you know, I, I'm a big fan of distributed networks and within institutions, what we have done is it, it was originally faculty that, you know, we were reaching out to, but we have now set up librarians groups and we have pockets of support within librarians at institutions. We have an instructional design community an educational technology community and all of these different communities and all of these different pathways within the institutions. We're trying to embed open with those groups so that it does create this sort of distributed network to build in the kind of resiliency that uh, to, to, that's okay, unfortunate. I, there's one, one last question. We're at time. So la last question here. I want to say thank you to all of you as well as BC Campus uh, about professional development. My name is Manisha. I work with a very small First Nations college just um, one hour south of Edmonton, Muscogee's Cultural College. So the professional training which you do, like BC Campus, I love you. <laughs> uh, we keep it, uh, you know, we, we need to learn about 
the recent one about spirituality, like care, um, you know, in, in open pedagogy, um, they are really very much valued. And number two, for small organizations like us, we do not have, um, you know, this infrastructure um, or any funding to give to any of uh, us. I think what's the value? What's the purpose of creating OERs is because we don't have relevant, um, meaningful indigenous content. Mm. That's what my social work and other teachers say. Number two, open, just don't use, I don't use the word open or a lot of jargon in my college. We just do it. Just do it. <laughs> Meaning two, two examples I want to give you in one second. Uh, so uh, one, we used Norway's open digital library because it is in our strategic plan to produce indigenous children's books. Our strategic plan 1.5.2 says publish indigenous children's books without any budget for publishing. So we use Norway's digital library. We didn't have to pay any graphic designer, partnered with our linguistic class of students. They are fluent Cree speakers, so in Cree syllabics, uh, we created a lot of books. Um, so it, it really helps uh, to hear the audio and the books too. Um, you know, so it's relevant content, local uh, faces, uh, um, you know, in the, in the books. Number two, this COVID has been great for open education movement. <laughs> well, Zoom is so easy, so we converted all our student presentations um, into open resources. So we have a collection of uh, 300 videos which our students created. That's why I'm saying just do it. Don't yeah. get into too much jargon about Creative Commons licensing or what open means. Just do it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's a great ending. Thank you all. Thank you to the wonderful panelists and the those brave enough to come up here and those brave enough to ask questions. Thank you, everyone.